Welcome to the Cigar and Champagne Masterclass hosted by John and Ken. John, let's kick off with yourself. Over to you. Welcome, everybody. And I'm going to start off by uh, opening a bottle. Uh, I've got a uh, Lanson uh, non-vintage uh, rosé, uh, which we'll discuss uh, different types of champagnes in this masterclass. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, how uh, the traditional method for opening a bottle of champagne uh, just to show you, and um, what I would, while I'm doing this, um, uh, I'm going, I'm going to also show you four different types of uh, glassware uh, that we we commonly use with uh, champagne: uh, the traditional coupe, um, the flute, but with um, this flute and this flute is slightly different because uh, the lip tapers in, so they're, they're slightly different. And finally, uh, the tulip glass. Okay, so I'm gonna pour them into one of those, but I'm gonna get uh, Ken to discuss um, the idea of nucleation. This is why I'm doing this, uh, which has to do with loss of gas. So Ken, if you wanna take it away while I, I'm opening this. Discuss what? Nucleation. <laughs> nucleation, have you heard of it? <laughs> Uh, Great start. Uh, can you okay, do cigar with me too, John? Right. <laughs> opening, the, opening the bottle at 45, uh, 45 degrees. I take my tulip glass and I pour it in at 45 degrees. And that is the traditional way or the, the way that houses of uh, champagne in France or sommeliers would um, pour a glass of champagne. That's how it's done. The, the opening is quite, I haven't got a bottle with me, I should have, actually this is olive oil, but, um, but these days it's basically hold the bottom and twist the top and you, is the easiest way. The bead you get out of the uh, the champagne that goes in, and sometimes you'll, if you're in a restaurant, they'll pour a glass and it'll be dead flat and you'll think things stuffed. It's more likely to be that you've got a glass that's got dishwashing liquid all over it, um, hasn't been rinsed properly. Um, the other time you'll get no bead is if you've got the perfect glass. And Riedel, for example, actually employ this woman who her entire job is to make a little tiny cross at the bottom of every glass. So it's got the, the uh, carbon dioxide, it's got something to latch onto to come out of the wine. Um, if, if, if that's not there, sometimes you, you actually look as though you've got a completely flat um, glass of champagne. Can I just jump in there, Kenny? Um... I think if, when anyone asks a question or has a comment, if you could just let the audience know what you're drinking, what you're smoking. So Rob Ayala, Nudie, 2011 and uh, 2021, and just a bottle of Mull, non-vintage. I got two glasses here. Which one should I use? I wouldn't be using the, the one that pans out. I'd be, I'd be sticking with well, the one on your right. Why? Um, Why is that, Ken? Oh, the one that everything escapes with that um the one that right. faces in a bit it can trap the stuff you're seeing a lot of the, the premium makers now actually going more towards white wine glasses uh rather than flutes um krug for example won't let you pour krug into uh, flutes anymore they get very upset um so they want the, the full wine glass experience i've always sense. just gone for the glass which holds the most but yes. that would that now I'm only going to use this one here. Okay, I'm back to mute. Yeah, I've done the same thing. That's a, yeah, that's a. I've done the same thing. This is a kind of flute, but I, I typically drink uh, champagne out of, uh, it, it's a kind of a thinner Chardonnay glass that, that I like. Um, oh, this is those the same are, thing. I can, stick, yeah. I can stick my nose in and get a little bit more out of it. Put one down there. Moses is the flute for me. All good. I'm drinking a uh, 2006 Comte Champagne. Beautiful. Yep. That's perfect. Mm. So, so the point I, I wanted to start off things with is that um, champagne houses spend a lot of time and money uh, researching how to maintain that gas in there, uh, for the longest period. So the method I used to open the champagne and the glass I poured it in is the current thinking. And champagne, uh, the way we do things with champagne has changed a lot over time, which we're going to discuss further in this uh, masterclass uh, 
how we've come to this point ha has come from the way things were done in the past and they were done very differently. So the, the next thing um, that I wanted to uh, discuss and bring up was um, and something that's dear to a number of us is uh, the idea of uh, prestige prestige curvays. Uh, I think I've said that correctly because um, the greater majority of champagne sold in the world are, are non-vintages and, and we'll discuss that further what that actually means but um, uh, Ken, uh, you, you know the the first prestige cuvée sort of brought out uh, brought out to the market not by accident but by circumstances. I'm talking about Louis Rodrier Cristal. Well, uh, now you, you'll get lots of debate about that. Um, technically, it's probably Dom, um, but yep. they did an odd thing as well. Um, <coughs> it's sort of considered their first. Their 1921 was the first, and that was released in 1934. The problem was. It wasn't in Dom bottles. It was just in normal old Moet bottles. And then they started to get this idea of how good it would be to, to have this prestige cuvee because no one else had one. So they started the Dom bottles, but they had these earlier ones. So what they did was actually literally the transfer arch into Dom bottles, um, which is a very dicey thing to do, uh, particularly with champagne, because you've got every chance of losing uh, your freshness and fizz. But that's what they did. Cristal or Rotor argued Cristal were the first, I think it's back in the 1870s from memory. Um, yes. What they did was, um, uh, but they had a huge market in Russia and the Tsar decided he wanted something special for himself. And so they agreed. They, they made, I don't know how many, a couple of dozen probably, maybe even more, um, out of a, the bottle was crystal, hence the name. Uh, it was perfectly clear because he wanted to be able to see into it to make sure no one was sticking anything into it to poison him. He wanted no punt uh, because they could put broken glass down the side of a punt and he might not notice it. Now, with that, of course, you then, oh, well, I mean, that was just done for the Tsar and that was it. Uh, when Cristal came back, I think 45, they decided to um, have a, to bring um, Cristal in permanently as a prestige cuvee. Uh, they followed, obviously the bottles aren't crystal, crystal uh, it's just too expensive, uh, but they followed everything else, the flat punt, uh, the clear bottles, but they, there's always that yellow cellophane, which you've got to keep on your bottle. If you've got a bottle and you're whacking the cellar, keep that stuff around it, no matter how silly it looks, because it protects from the light, because champagne can get destroyed by light. Um, Very important. Very important. Any clear bottle, you really got to protect it. So just to add to what you said there, Ken, um, sorry, sorry, Brett, I'll, 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 I'll let you go. In the, I'll let you add uh, in a second, but um, uh, some excellent points. Um, so Prestige Curve, the idea is that it's the best of the best of, um, grapes used in the champagne of, of the house. And Alexander II was that czar because his great, great oh, his grandfather, and I was talking on, uh, to a few members on Zoom, um, was a, a, Frank, a, a Francophile. Uh, uh, he loved uh, the French culture um, so much that um, he made the, Ru uh, the Russian court speaking French um, thereafter. And, uh, and so that's why he, he ordered that, um, that Louis Rotor bottle. But um, like you hit the nail on the head. I was, I was thinking the same things. You know, the, the idea of light hitting a champagne bottle, which a lot of us you know, are not aware of. The white, white's got to be dark. White can damage champagne. But he had to have a Damn clear wine. Yes, definitely. Um, he had to have a clear. He had to have nothing down the bottom because you notice champagne bottles, um, they have um, like, uh, what do they call that? Do they call that the punt, you said? Punt. Uh -huh punt where you can hold your thumb in there and hold it. Yep. Uh, Louis Cristal bottle was flat in case someone put dynamite into it. So there's some strange things going there with the Louis Radere Cristal design that carries on to this day. And, and when the Romanov family were um, uh, effect effectively assassinated uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917, it, it made, I think it made Louis Radere think the, the, the house thing, what are we gonna do? I mean, this is such a great champagne. And, and then I think that influenced the, the market to, to uh, in the sense that, okay, we're going to release this to market, you know, um, maybe a bit like... Oh, John, John, I think they'd st that um, those bottles of Cristal were, for the Tsar, were largely a one-off or maybe, maybe you know, five or six dozen. I don't think, I, I might be wrong, but I don't think they kept making them for him. Um, and when they did yeah. come around to do it, it was 
you're talking 30 years after the revolution. Yeah, 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 that, that's, that, that's right. Brett, did you want to add something to all the talk about? I was just going to. I was just going to reaffirm what Ken had said about light strike. Champagne is particularly vulnerable. And luckily, most champagne doesn't come in clear bottles. But that's actually why if you buy a bottle of Renard, uh, which is a very good non-vintage, it will come in a, uh, a little sleeve, which, like with Cristal, you should keep on because the clear bottles provide no protection. All, all the good clear bottle stuff have some kind of paper or... Uh, clip or cellophane. Uh, uh, for, uh, I, I mean, well, some of them don't. Like, I know Francis Egli makes uh, rose in the clear bottle, uh, and I've never seen that on store shelves wrapped in anything. Now, most people probably buy that by the case, but yeah. uh, if you've ever opened a wine and had it had it, like a had it smell like cabbage <clears throat> or sulfur, um, which I had with. One, one of those wines that I bought from uh, one of those uh, Eggly rosés, that's that's Light Strike for those who are less familiar. Well, rosé, you want to show the color off. So there's kind of that's why off. they do it. Hmm. Exactly right, yeah. So let's, well, let's talk about... about Dom, Dom, the other thing ahead. about uh, Dom Perignon is yep. um, Moet never... They didn't have uh, rights to the name. Um, the name was originally owned by Mercia. And how they got it was... Uh, one of the um, uh, Shandon um, children was getting married. I may have been to a Mercia, but I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, so Mercia decided we'll give them the, the name as a, uh, a wedding gift. So that's how they got the name uh, Dom Perignon. I, I would believe that story, other than the apocryphal story of the monk that sort of was making the um, yeah the the wine or the champagne while no one was oh, noticing. Don Perignon, he's a very famous man, and he, and he, he certainly him in Ruin Art. Yeah, in Ruin Art also at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Those guys, uh, you can go to the Abbey, and the Abbey is an extraordinary place, and you can see some of the tools and that that he was using. But he was reputed. I mean, if you go to the tour now, they talk mm. about. Um, Don Perignon saying, oh, I'm drinking stars. It was a load of crap. He, he tried his best to keep bubbles out of his wines. He was, he was quite brilliant in what he did. He could pick uh, where the, which vineyards grapes came from. Uh, he was one of the first to go into blending. He was one of the first to bring in corks. Uh, he made white wine out of black grapes. Uh, he did all these things which were essential for champagne in the long run, but he certainly wasn't there trying to make um, champagne. Yeah, I, I wanted to know. Uh, I wanted the next thing I wanted to bring up, um, Ken. Um, am I right in saying? And you can talk further about this. Um, the whole beauty of champagne is getting the balance between the three main grapes. I mean, there are seven, but the other four aren't used that often. So the three main grapes are going to champagne, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay. That's the, the whole beauty of balancing those grapes and, and the years and getting... The other four, I think, were Arbane, Petit Meslier, uh, Pinot Blanc, Pinot yeah. Gris. They're basically yes. just curiosities these days. Gamay was one, but it's now been completely ruled out. Um, you do see the occasional champagne as a curiosity that's got them, but 99.99% um, you know, .99 are, are from one or more of those three grapes. And it's, it, look, the balancing is certainly part of it. Um, the whole champagne concept to me is this blend. Non-vintage is a blend of vintages. They blend vineyards. Uh, they blend grapes. Um, all this stuff about, oh, we've, we've the tour of champagne. Normally that's rubbish because they're getting stuff from everywhere, blending it. Um, uh, Meunier is an interesting one because it tends to be seen as the, as the least of the three. It, um, uh, and a lot of places don't admit to growing it, even though they do. Um, I have a, a couple of vintage of Petit Meunier. I have a couple of vintage uh, bottles of Petit Meunier from Salmon. But Salmon's, that's one I've discovered recently, those guys. They some the club bottles, the club champagnes. Yeah, they do some really good stuff. And there's a few others that do it as well. Um, but uh, most of the prestige, Champagnes don't include any uh, Meunier. Uh, Krug is is interesting in that they do use it uh, in their vintage uh, and and say it's essential. And they quite quite often use high percentages. 
Um, yeah. Others, oh. yeah, others don't so much. And then, of course, you've got your blog to blogs, which is just purely Chardonnay. Um, so, but yeah, look, if, if you know. So this is an example of a Blanc de Blanc, uh, Chateau de Bligny, Blanc de Blanc. So let everyone know what, what a Blanc de Blanc is, completely Chardonnay. What, what if I use a completely 100% Pinot Noir? What, what's that called, Ken? Blanc de Noir. Blanc de Noir. So the different type of champagnes you can get. Yeah, you don't see Blanc de Noir very often. Um, things like Bollinger's VVF, and there are a few more, but uh, you see a lot more Blanc de Blanc. It works better as a as a single variety than uh, Pinot. Pinot tends to get a bit heavy. Uh, sorry, sorry. which one's Blanc de Blanc again? Which grapes? Chardonnay. 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 Can I just I, jump in? Just uh, say, hi, Faz, how are you? Faz, you're, you're on mute. My apologies. I've actually uh, got a Blanc de Blanc here, Charles Orban, and uh, smoking a uh, 2013 uh, HDM uh, De Dieu. Oh, aren't you special? Love the haircut, oh, yeah. by the way. Good stuff, mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, great I, stuff. I, so, I, Ken, I, two I, things. Two things. Do do you, um, what temperature should you drink champagne at? Because I think guys would love to know that. I mean, do you go as cold as possible? Do what do you like to drink? It? And do you swallow or do you savor? That's it. Sorry. Um, it, look, if it's cheap, make it as cold as possible. Good stuff. Yeah, you're probably talking anywhere between sort of. 10, 12, 14 degrees, um, thereabouts. Um, you don't want to, you don't want the good stuff too cold because uh, it, it just dulls the flavours. Um, swallow or so, well, I mean, you know, uh, one does what one feels like doing, whatever one enjoys, but uh, there's not much point in just pouring it down your throat without tasting it if you've paid 200 bucks for a bottle. Um, no, absolutely. Well, so, but when I say savour it, I mean, look, it, it was tongue in cheek. But when you, when you when I say savour it, you mean you're rolling it around your palate, you're taking, you're taking your time. Well, I, I tend to, but then I perhaps am a little bit more obsessive about these things than most people. Um, others Obsess may not. Obsessive yeah. is a very good word summarising your personality. Um, obsessive. Very good. All right. That's, that's me for five minutes. I'm, I'm out. <coughs> No, no, they're good. They're really good questions. I mean, the current. Um, well, most of you guys are really into champagne. I can yeah, say yeah. you're, you're very well educated on champagne. Um, but from a punter's perspective, and the yeah. questions I'll ask me from a punter's perspective, yeah, I buy, I get gifted a lot of champagne. I buy some champagne. I have very little idea about champagne, um, except that I enjoy it. Um, but so the questions that I'll put forward are simply ones that. If I don't understand something, I'll ask you to clarify it because what you guys will understand is probably not what the punter will understand. So that's there's, one, there's one thing. Are you going, no, this, guy, this is going great, by the way. I think this, I mean, I've learned so much in, in what? In the 20 minutes we've started with. Uh, I'll forget it shortly, but so far, so good. That's why you're recording it. You. Yeah, that's it, exactly right. Hey, Carl, good to see you. Sorry I left you in the waiting room there for a period of time, yeah? But, um, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> no, no, we, you, like 10 o'clock, you know, you know, FOH runs like a Swiss watch, yeah? <laughs> you're not first, you're last. <laughs> Back to you guys. One thing you, you should discuss is the champagne bucket and the, just the ceremony of champagne. It's, uh, and your thoughts on that, my friend? Yeah, well, I mean... Um... <laughs> Not part of the show, kind of, you know. I mean, if you're in a restaurant, yeah, they it, it it does make a difference. I mean, if they're making it too cold, pull the pull the bottle out, but otherwise leave it in there. Um, it, it's also it is safer a safer way to chill it rapidly than putting it in the freezer. Even when the best you're way I, the best way I know to chill a bottle of wine, if you want to chill it, champagne or whatever, is get a um, sopping wet tea towel, wrap it around your bottle, and stick it in the freezer, and you know, most of them are, are pretty cold in 10 to 15. If you've got a really good bottle of champagne, you might want to do it more gradually. But uh, if you want to chill something, that's to me, that's the quickest way. Um, otherwise, an ice bucket, yeah, with, with a bit of water in it as well to, to let yeah. the, the cold circulate. Yeah. There's a wonderful story if, just on that you reminded me with the ice bucket uh, from years ago. This guy 
um, and he was walking down, um, I forget which street in London, but past one of the great wine stores. And he looked in and, uh, and so he went in and he said, um, look, I'd like to uh, buy a, uh, uh, the best bottle of champagne. And, I, and this is quite a while ago. They said, oh, that'll be a, you know, NV poll or something for, for $20. And he said, oh, haven't you got anything better? He said, oh, well, we had got some very special ones that we'll have to get from the seller. He said, can you do that? And this went on backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Eventually, he um, came up with the, uh, uh, I think it was a, a dom or something, for about 70, 70 pounds, it would have been in England um, many years ago. And then he said, look, um, do you deliver? I'd like to have it delivered to a hotel room as a gift. And they said, oh, well, we can arrange that. Yes, that's fine. Uh, I'd like to have it delivered in, in a nice ice bucket. Oh, we don't, we don't do that. We haven't got it. He said, well, you got one in the, in, in the, uh, the window, in your display. And he said, uh, can we use that one? And they said, oh, I suppose so. Yeah, we don't, it's just there. So they wrapped it all up. He wrote a note, had it delivered to the hotel room, which turned out to be his hotel room. This arrived sort of that later that afternoon, a bottle of Dom in the ice bucket. He opened it, the note he'd written to himself, a beautiful performance. And then he took the ice bucket down to Christie's and sold it for 7,000 pounds. He knew <laughs> nothing about champagne, but he knew about um, things like ice buckets and, uh, and that sort of paraphernalia. And he spotted this one as some sort of incredible. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, that was um, off topic. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. Um, this, this, uh, the next, the next two things I wanted to um, go into, just to uh, again teach us all about um, where we've come to in in the modern day with champagne. One is um, uh, rose rose champagne, but we'll talk about that later. But um, more importantly, I, I want to discuss dosage, uh, the sugar content in champagne and how important that is to the history of Champagne and how um, what Madame Pomery, how she really changed things. Um, Ken, and I'll let you discuss all that because it, it brought about a big change uh, in the way that Champagne was drunk. Because before, before she did what she did, Champagne used to be an after dinner dessert drink, uh, which is not today. Uh, it's, 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 changed, you know, it's changed quite a bit in the way we, we drink. drink. Drink, uh, back, drink. back in the 1800s, champagne was very sweet normally. Um, and she wasn't the only one. There were a couple of them doing it. But, but for whatever reason, when she did it, it was most famous because um, she was a fairly famous woman, one of the richest women in France. And um, I think she owned uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, stable of racehorses in France, plus an incredible estate. So when she did something, it, people took notice. And she dropped the dosage. Um, I assume we're all familiar with dosage. It's the, basically the level of sweetness that goes into the wine right at the end. Uh, it gives it, you know, sometimes they don't use any. Uh, sometimes sorry, sorry Ken, I, th I think it's pronounced dosage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is. <laughs> That's wrong. Here, it is pronounced as I want it to be pronounced. <laughs> and you can stay on mute. Um, <laughs> Anyway, she, she um, dropped it right down. She, it was, still would have been incredibly sweet to us today, but it was much less sweet than people in, in London were used to. And they, they liked it. And that started the trend. Uh, but even early, early um, uh, 1900s, there was the, the, the level of sweetness in champagne was still much higher than we have today. Um, I mean, for, if they, that famous one from the uh, bottom of the Baltic, the 1907 Heidsieck. Um, that was actually, feel free to correct the pronunciation, Gut American, which apparently meant the taste of Americans, which was considered to be sweeter than most of the rest of the world at the time. Um, so that was specifically bottled uh, as a, a, a sweeter wine. Um, although after 100 years when it was finally drunk, uh, a lot of that had sort of disappeared. Uh, but even if you go back to the dosages of uh, things, uh, well, um, John, you would have seen we had the 71 uh, Piper Heisen yes. just recently. 
Uh, yes. This was a wine that spent 48 years on lees and they just released it again. They put in 10 grams dosage, which they interestingly, um, they blended with Chardonnay from the, 1919, uh, the 2019 vintage because they felt that had similarities to 71. But 10 grams for a prestige is fairly high. Yet yes. when this was originally released, it was 12 grams. They dropped it back a bit. Yep. Um, but it was very acidic, which is why they had the higher level of dosage. Sorry, guys. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll add to what you're saying. So in the past, you had four main regions that um, the Champagne houses looked at um, in terms of, you know, uh, their Champagne distribution. And um, they they adjusted the dosages or the dosage <laughs> according to those regions. So the Gou Anglais, Gou mean the French word for um, taste, which we get the English word gout because King Henry VIII um, loved his meat and his fish to the point where, you know, he had problems with uh, um, arthritis, uh, uric acid in his toes and his uh, fingers. This will get the English word gout, but in French, the word is uh, gou, G-O-U-T. So gou anglais, which, which, which was, um, it was the, the least sweetest, and that was 22 grams to 66 grams um, per litre. Um, and then you had the um, Gu, I'm going off memory here. So Gu, um, America, uh, Gu American, uh, 110 grams to 165 grams. So very, very sweet. Um, and then Gu Francais, which was 165 to 200. And then finally the Gu Rus, the Russian, 200 to 300. They're astronomically sweet. Now, as a comparison for our American friends, Coca-Cola is 108 grams per liter. 10.8%. Uh, yeah. So we're talking about champagne. If you were to drink it today, you wouldn't recognise it as champagne. And current, currently, um, uh, uh, the the most common dosage, um, and, and Ken, um, what you were uh, saying um, for Prestige Curves, um, to, to, to bring it out at 12% is on the higher side of a brute because a brute would be 7 to 12 grams per litre or 0.7 to 1.2 percent it's not much so mm. what Madame Pomery did in um, bringing bringing down the, the the sweetness for the English market just completely changed everything because to this day I would contend and you can add more to this the the English market uh, for 67 million people they they sell a strong astronomical amount of champagne uh, in that in that country um, so even more those, than the US. I was going to just jump in for those who hang out with supermodels. No, Ken does occasionally um, in Cuba specifically. Um, but remember, you see them often drinking Ayala champagne, which is owned by Bollinger these days, and, and they have a low dosage uh, version of it. And, and, and the models often drink that specific champagne because of its minimal, minimal sugar content. It's um, a good question. Is avarice against sugar. No dosage is just playing towards that. Yeah. I, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, dosage is not, uh, the amount of dosage is not an indicator of quality. A, a wine will not be better just because it doesn't have, it doesn't quote unquote need extra sugar yeah. added to it. Um, and as Ken pointed out, I mean, if you consider a, that a, a bottle is a standard bottle, 750 milliliters even at 10 grams per liter, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, seven and a half grams being added to the entire bottle. It's, it's nothing. And a lot of those models don't realize the- uh, um, They're not the very smart. Yeah. Um, but that's true, yeah. Look, I mean, probably 70s, 80s, dosage was in general around about 10 to 14 for most of the top houses with their non-vintages. But they've slowly, slowly worked them down. They don't, and these days, this the sort of the Goot American Goot English whatever is a thing of the past. They well, they yes. certainly claim it to be. They they deny that. In fact, they've denied it for decades um, that there were differences. Um, but what we see now is, I mean, for example, uh, Moet. Uh, if you look at what Moet was, um, uh, Benoit Guez. Again, apologies for the pronunciation. He has ever so slightly refined that dosage down over time. I suspect it's now about eight or nine. Um, the wines, and he's done other stuff as well, of course, but the wine looks a hell of a lot better than it did 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 
Uh, Didier Mariotti did the same thing with mum. There's, it's a general trend. The, uh, Rob mentioned Ayala and their no dosage. There are quite a few of those around. I'm not a fan. Um, occasionally you get one that's okay. Uh, Rotary do their Stark, which is not bad, um, but it's got to be from a, a, a pretty warm, ripe vintage um, and a good vineyard. But in general, I find if you go down to no dosage, the wines are too hard and they don't age particularly well. Exceptions, there's exceptions to everything, but as a general rule, I and I think a lot of the winemakers have worked this out as well. They've gone back up to two or three. If they're looking for that almost no dosage, they now actually go to two or three um, because it just makes a difference, um, a positive difference. Yeah, so I think those um, uh, champagnes uh, that uh, have less sugar than seven grams per litre, they're called extra brut. Is that they correct? can be called extra brute. They can label it brute if they want to, though. I'll, I'll just show you, gentlemen, uh, if we go to the other side and we have slightly sweeter champagnes, just in Go case on. you didn't know. Um, just in regards to uh, that, just in regards yeah. to, uh, you were saying about Madame uh, Pomery, uh, in regards to the uh, English market. Yes. Uh, from what I remember, uh, it was actually due to the uh, English love of hard cider and uh, mm -hmm. it being a lot less sweet than uh, champagne at the time. So Homery wanting to take the in English market, actually drop that dosage to actually, you know, cater more to the mm -hmm. English taste of a less sweeter, uh, you know, uh, drink. The, the English no, no, no. ground sparkling wines are pretty good. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting as, cli as the, because of climate change, dosage has slowly gone down as the wines have become riper. And uh, England, because of climate change, also because of climate change, has increasingly been able to, uh, to grow wine, even though normally it would be too north of a latitude. Uh, and they're becoming quite popular and, and quite expensive in some cases. The problem Brad, is Brad, sorry, opinion. Brad, you almost got the yellow card there because really, outside of now mentioning religion and guns, uh, we've already done climate change. That's right. Um, so you're, you're, a warning, you're a warning. Card up. <laughs> so if I mention religion, guns, and climate change, I can go. Oh. Um, the, uh, the English wines, the problem with English wines is there's just such a tiny, tiny quantity of, of the decent stuff because they, they all talk about challenging champagne. The problem is if you're only making three buckets, you're not going to challenge uh, uh, champagne to any extent at all. Um, but one of the, uh, someone here has got a bottle of 242, I think. No? Someone said they were going to bring the 242. Uh, the 242 is the new Rotorer um, collection, uh, which has replaced their what they used to call the premier brute, which was their non-vintage. Now that was their major seller. It's a turnaround and, and dump your major seller um, and replace it with something else. It's a very brave thing to do, but these guys, are, are they're, they're seriously talented winemakers and they know what they're doing. It's, and the reason for bringing in this 242, which is again, a, a, a non-vintage style, it's called 242 because it's a 242nd blend they've made. Next year will be the 248th or whatever it is. Anyway. Um, but the reason is because they wanted to change styles. And, and you mentioned it there, um, Brett, with the ripeness. The, the search in the 70s and 80s was to get wines ripe. Because until climate change came along, sorry, um, that was an issue in that area. Now, they don't have that same issue. Um, it's not, not a challenge to get their wines ripe. What they want to do is get their wines fresh. And that's why he's changed this whole style. And now that's why we've got 242 instead of the old Premier um, Brut. And I think it's a better wine. I, mean, it's, I think it's a fantastic wine. Uh, I was just going to, um, before I show these champagnes, I was going to ask you, Ken, um, I, I remember um, researching a story this weekend that the popularity of champagne in England too, Buzz has a point about the love of cider and that, that, that certainly... Um, help them with loving champagne, but also the idea that um, the Champagne region, so just to let everyone know that um, the Champagne region is about 100 miles northeast of Paris, um, 160 kilometres, um, and that is the only place that you're allowed to uh, grow grapes, uh, put those three grapes we mentioned before, the Pinot Noir, the Pinot Meunier, and the Chardonnay, uh, 
make champagne and call it champagne. If it's if it's made in other areas of France uh, in the same method, uh, it's called a cremant. Uh, so it's, it's not allowed to be called a champagne. So the story goes that uh, this champagne was made in the in that region. Uh, uh, I don't know when, 100, 100, 200 years ago. Um, in a cold environment, went over to England where it was a bit warmer and while the bottles were sitting, the, the champagne fermented and, and made more gas. So oh, I don't know how John, true that is. Older than, long, longer before 100 years it would have been um, and they were shipping the stuff in barrels and that was yeah. when it was, uh, the cold was sort of preventing a second fermentation but as it started to warm up, basically you started, all of a sudden you had barrels exploding because um, of the second fermentation. And that's sort of one of the, the stories about the origins of champagne. Yeah, and the reason why they had still had sugar is that they, it got cold too quickly and they couldn't finish their primary fermentation so that when it warmed up in the spring, then they went, underwent the secondary fermentation. But you're right, it was in barrels. Mm. I, I just wanted to show everyone um, some, some uh, bottles of champagne that, uh, you know, are different because they're not uh, the normal seven to 12 grand dosage, the brute that probably counts for 95% uh, of, uh, uh, of worldwide sales. So this is a, a Tatanger Nocturne, uh, which I think is about 17 uh, grams per, per litre. It's called a sec. And the next level above a sec, which is about 17 to 32 grams, I think. Uh, actually, it could be a bit more. So I'll, I'll look it up, but it's uh, actually, a demi sec might, might, might go up to 50. Yeah, have to go up to 50, yeah. Uh, the uh, Laurent Perrier Harmony, uh, if you can see that. That's, I think that's this is about 40 grams of sugar. And I, 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 like, I don't mind these. These are different for me. Um, and if you had to recommend a dessert champagne, I don't know if you've drank a lot, but if you had to recommend one, which can you off the top of your head think of one to recommend? I'd probably, probably jump on uh, the Verve Riche. I've probably seen that more than most of the others. Um, I'm not a great fan of those styles. Um, I don't think I've ever been asked to recommend one of those before in my life, but uh, <laughs> I'd probably think of the uh, of, of Riche uh, from Verve, uh, simply because I, I know it. So you just go with regular champagne, your favorite for after dinner instead? Yeah, I, I <laughs> very rarely go to sweet ones. Yeah. <laughs> <It's absolutely laughs> fair enough. John, just yeah, in regards right. to the sec and the demi sec, the uh, sec is, uh, is 17 to 32 grams per litre. The yeah. uh, demi sec is 32 to 50. You're right. And the sweetest one being the do is uh, more than 50 grams per litre. Which is basically non existent. It's, uh, yeah, it's just not made really. Not yeah, all, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much um, these days. Um, so let's talk about houses, uh, uh, Ken. Um, which is uh, Maison, so you know the uh, the brands that we we commonly know. Um, basically, uh, worldwide, uh, I'll go through the most popular. Um, that's not necessarily mean they're the best. And if I I like to put it out to the forum here, what you guys all enjoy, because um, this would be an interesting discussion. Uh, worldwide. Uh, the most popular tends to be uh, Moet de Chandon uh, and uh, Vif Plico are uh, second. Um, but French, now this is where it's interesting. Uh, in France, um, they might uh, account for about 40% of all production. But the French market is completely different to the world market. They, they don't have the idea, the idea of houses to you know like brands it isn't such a big deal like the rest of the world so in france 55 percent of sales are houses and 45 percent are just wine growers or cooperatives and, and i know you'll discuss that further and in france um uh, nicolas foire uh is the most popular brand which only came about in 1976 and another brand like canard de chain uh, is like the third best so they're not really into big houses over there. So, I mean, I just thought I'd share oh, that with everybody. Nicholas, Nicholas Ford's a huge house. Um, oh, like worldwide now it is, yeah. 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 And Canard's are also reasonably large as well. They've done a lot of work. Um, they've done a lot more on quality than the Nicholas uh, people 
for a while. Well, yeah. I'm sure that they'd, they'd disagree with that, but uh, um, he's so he's, he's recently gone. passed away, but he, he was completely involved in a different line of business. I, forget, I was reading this morning, I, was, I forget what it was, but uh, he invented, well, he brought about this champagne named after himself in 1976, it's become the number one selling um, champagne in France. I think it's the third biggest brand in the world now. And the peculiarity of it is that um, it, it, he really increased the Pinot Meunier uh, grape in it uh, in comparison to other um, uh, champagnes. And I guess, Ken, you can add um, maybe your yeah, thoughts. Oh, he, did, he, did, he did an extraordinary job. I mean, turning yep. nothing, basically cooperative, into, into something uh, worldwide. And yeah, but yeah, look, he did an extraordinary job uh, uh, building a house. Uh, Mercia is another one in France. I always thought Mercia was the... Uh, it may have been taken over now, but it used to be the largest in France. The French are, are a lot, lot more. They buy their bottle of champagne at the uh, local supermarket and they'll have it for yes. dinner and it'll be eight yes. to ten euros. They're not, they don't quite see it the same. I mean, obviously, right. they still have it for the celebrations and things like that. Um, and there are heaps of great stories with the French with all of that sort of stuff. There's one about um, when uh, the, um, uh, the Allies were coming up from the, the south, heading up towards Paris. And the American generals provided the French with their plan. And the French took one look and went, no, nah, nah, hopeless, go away. And so the, the American, they put a lot of work into this and they were a bit surprised that so they went away and they prepared another one. No, nah, rubbish, rubbish. And they sent him away a third time. The Americans weren't getting any happier about this. They came back with a third one. The French, yes, perfect, this is it. It was only much later at the end of the war, one of the uh, American generals was talking to one of his French counterparts and he said to them, look, we put a lot of work into those, those plans for the movement of the troops up through France and we thought we had the best, uh, the ideal plan and you kept knocking it back. Can you tell us why? You wanted to march through Champagne, you wanted to march through all our good vineyards. We're not having that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they stopped and... Uh, uh, there's a heap of stories along. There's another one where uh, 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 it must have been a roundabout uh, Normandy, uh, at least w June 6 or whatever it was, and uh, uh, a battalion or whatever you call them uh, of Americans arrived quite uh, down the south. I hadn't realised that they also um, invaded from down there as well. And they were, the, the Americans were expecting huge resistance at this particular area where they landed. And uh, they landed, and there was nothing. So they quickly set up on the beach, and then finally they saw one bloke walking towards them. It was just one bloke, and they thought this is a bit odd. They got all the guns ready, and this guy—he looked like a waiter. And sure enough, as he got closer, he was a waiter with a tray, a bottle of champagne, and a few glasses. Um, and they just thought, "What the hell?" And he walked up, and the general, "What the hell are you doing here?" We wanted to welcome you. And so the general thought he'd be funny and said, well, that's not going to go far, is it? He said, we've been waiting a long time. We had to drink something. Um, so the poor old uh, the American was left. He, one bottle of champagne for the entire battalion. But uh, anyway, sorry, that's completely sidetracked. That's you, all good. No, it's okay. I, I, before, before I put it out there what our favourite uh, houses are, because I, I think if we... If we uh, open up to the forum what your favourite brand is, you're not necessarily going to find that it's uh, Maui Teche and Don or Viv Coco. But I, I wanted to ask your thoughts, Ken, on uh, what it means to a champagne if I have more Pinot Noir grape or more Chardonnay grape or you know, more Pinot Meunier grape. Um, is there thoughts on that? Um, yeah. Um, um, look, the, the Pinot Noir tends to make the richer, fuller, heavier style. So, for example, the Sir Winston's, uh, tend to have a very high percentage of uh, Pinot Noir. Bollinger obviously has a lot of Pinot Noir. Um, Chardonnay tends to be more elegant, uh, leaving aside the Blanc de Blancs, which are an obviously separate category. Uh, they can provide um, uh, sometimes stone fruit character, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, they also tend to age very well. Pinot Noir um, is considered not to age well, though Krug dispute that. And given that they've used a fair bit of Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir in their vintages over many years. They've obviously either got great uh, 
a great source of those grapes or you know, they're right and everyone else is wrong. Uh, but that tends to provide a more earthy, fruity uh, character, often in the middle of the palate. And you can sometimes see in old, old mullets, which age very well, it's also there. You see it in the middle, middle palate. <coughs> Pardon me. That's okay. Uh, so uh, it, th thanks, thanks for that. I'm really interested in what you, you bring up because my uh, champagne journey um, uh, reflects uh the the champagne report from 2020 um in it pointed out that australia was an anomaly um every other region um so for example the three main the three biggest markets in the world uh the us uh the uk and um japan uh, all went backwards uh about 18 to 25 percent because of the pandemic but australia was about the only country that went up uh it increased in sales about 12 percent if you can believe that. Um, and um, I was just putting my thoughts as to why Australia would in, import more champagne um, last year than every other country in the world. And I think there's only one reason. Uh, and I think the reason was to do with what happened in my family, because what happened with my family was I was planning to travel overseas. And uh, with the pandemic, um, we were one of those countries that we just weren't allowed to travel out or, or very hard to travel in. And so my wife and I decided to, uh, we were fortunate enough, we, we were able to get uh, refunds rather than credits on our uh, uh, ticket purchases to go to, to, to Greece. Uh, we, we were with Qatar Airways and being a government airline, they refunded the, the, the funds. And so I think myself, like a lot of other Australians, um, decided to use those funds to, um, just treat ourselves to the fact that, you know, we were in this lockdown period and uh, we're going to look after ourselves and it, enjoy life as best we can. And we, 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 what my story is, is that how I got to this point was we decided to look into champagne and we um, use those funds to just, you know, basically try champagnes, try a whole lot of different champagnes and try a whole, you know, uh, different brands, um, different dosages, di just whatever it was, and then put them into a spreadsheet. And um, the interesting thing for, just for us uh, is, and my wife and I just tend to have the same palate. So, and my wife's very, um, she t it's, there was some champagne she had that she was like allergic to. So we, wouldn't, we couldn't continue to have that, um, which was interesting. But, and I was saying, saying to this on the phone to you, um, Ken, the other day that for, for my, for my wife and I, we both love champagne, but um, we tended to go towards the champagnes that had more Chardonnay grape. Um, and it was consistent throughout. When I look at the, the different houses and what they have in terms of those, the percentages of those three grapes, and they all have different percentages. But um, the, the ones that really stood out to us that were, well, my personal favourite, uh, Lanson, Tadanger, Paul Roger, yeah, those three are the highest for me. Um, I, and I'm going to put it out there. A lot of, uh, they've got a fantastic Blanc de Blanc. The non vintage yep. is normally a third of each of the three grapes. But beyond that, the vintage and, and certainly the Sir Winston is heavily um, Pinot Noir. Yeah. Um, but Tattinger certainly is a, a champagne house. Uh, it, it, it's worthwhile at this point to include the others um, to yeah. just nominate your, your top three that you yeah. enjoy. The Let's top three ahead, that. That you enjoy. So, John, what's your top three? M myself, Def definitely. No, no, um, John Bennett. John Bennett. You said yeah, you gave sorry. yours, yeah? John Bennett. Yeah, did, sorry. sorry, John. John, what's your top, top, top three houses? So, your top three champagnes that you enjoy on a regular basis? What would they be? Your top three houses? Yeah, I've only got two actually. The the the, the Lotero 242 that I've just started drinking and the Paul Roger. I like that. Yeah, I've always been I've always been a Paul man. I I, I love it. Um, just not, not vintage is regular and and the Sir Winston when I want something relatively special. But I I wouldn't. I, I'd still go through. Couple, I'd go through a couple of bottles of Sir Winston every month. I I do enjoy that, and I didn't realize it was that special. I mean I. I just enjoy the flavour. It's a big one. It's it, it just 
it just lasts on the palate. It's beautiful. It's rich. Um, and, and it's, so I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to hearing some other suggestions there. El Jose, there. What do you? What, what I mean? You can't drink your good stuff every day, or can you? What are you drinking every day? What you got your top three? Sure. No, I would say. Um, I would say Paul Roger. You hit it top to bottom. Um, you know, I think Paul Roger is consistently one of my favorites. Moet too is is another one that I, I think it's probably. You know, it's, it's obviously it's, it's, they produce a lot of uh, of wines. Um, but they, they make good stuff, and, and and up to within the prestige cuvee category, um, the Winston Churchill certainly. But it's 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 for for me at least uh, where I live, it's it's hard to access. It's not something you're drinking regularly, you know. Uh, but Don Perignon, um, you know, tends to be the cliche kind of premier cuvee bottle. But yeah, and some of the ones they've made that are more Chardonnay heavy. Yeah, you know, I, I like John said. I never thought about that, but but uh, yeah, I never tried to tie it back. But the uh, Don Perignon for me too is, is always I, yeah, Cristal versus Don Perignon versus uh, some of these others. I I always go back to, to Don Perignon. So Moet too is another one that for me, top to bottom, seems to be a pretty good house. But I'm you know again I'm I'm a rookie here compared to uh, a lot of other folks. Bijan, what do you what do you do at home? Yeah, I, I like Paul Roger. I, I just started drinking it because you guys mentioned it all the time, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, Barf Clicquot, just because it's so popular in Canada, it's everywhere. And then the one I'm drinking right now is uh, Delamotte Blanc, Blanc de Blanc. Yeah, that, that one's very good, too. I, uh, of the ones I have, that I enjoy that one very much. Moses? Yeah, the, uh, for the mainstream ones, I'm, uh, I like the Philip Hinot and... Um, uh, you know, for the maybe more geekier of so Pierre Peters, the Andre Jacquard are my uh, two go-tos. You know, the you know any of the big ones you name the Cristal Dom. There are any of those are a treat. But uh, I say the Andre Jacquard is probably my favorite brand. And Enrio is another one I like for the big names. Chris, Buzz. Hey. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> Apologies. When you say Chris, I, I, I don't really recognize the name. <laughs> okay. Uh, for me, it would be uh, Paul Roger, uh, Homery, and also uh, Laurent Perrier. Hmm. I actually quite enjoy uh, Laurent Perrier. Uh, the, uh, I, find it, I, I find it quite intriguing. I mean, the Nicolas Fouillard is nice as a starter. Champagne being very an extremely light uh, style, but it's not one that I that, that I would normally uh, yeah just go out and grab. But the Laurent Perrier definitely is one that I would tend to keep uh, at home. So I find, Kenny, uh, Kenny, I, I, won't, <coughs> I won't ask you because <coughs> excuse me, I assume you'd be compromised if you actually you asked your, your your top three. Yeah, so look, what do you I'm enjoy when, when you actually spend your own coin, which is probably what nineteen seventy six. But what, what 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 would you what would you be buying? Um, before I get to that, there was a couple of comments. One was Dom, and yeah, Dom is seen as this giant, um, you know, huge, huge brand for the celebrities, but is also one of the most brilliant wines on the planet. Um, they've had this guy Richard Dufour, who's now just retired. Um, he's he's been the cellar master for twenty odd years. He is he's as mad as a cut snake. He is seriously away with the fairies. But he is an absolute genius, the stuff he did. And he turned that wine into just one of the, even though they make incredible quantities, it's almost all, the only one that I've not fussed on was 03, but that's more that I hate 03s rather than, than that particular. But other than that, you look at the Doms, the 02s, the, the 8s, the, uh, there's just so many of them that uh, have come out are fantastic. The other thing, Delamotte. Um, the mention of Delamotte, one of the great bargains you can get in, in Champagne is if you buy vintage Delamotte from years that they don't produce Salon because the two houses are linked, which basically means that the grapes that would go into Salon go down to uh, uh, Delamotte instead. And so instead of paying, you know, I think the last, the 08 Salon, you had to buy it in a little package and cost you 15 grand. Um, so 
you're paying probably 100, 150 for the Delamont. The difference is, given that they're the grapes that they would have used, it's 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 one of the great bargains you can find. Uh, but personally, look, I mean, this is a whole heap. But one one that I do use, my, oh, I bought some 242 recently. I thought that was so good. I bought some uh, 2013, sorry, 2012 Mum, uh, because well, it was a ridiculous bargain, and it's a good champagne. Uh, I, every year I try and buy uh, from, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Ulysses Colin, uh, C-A-L-L-I-N. Um, he was, he's an interesting one because I remember um, some of the Americans who are interested in wine might know Matt Kramer. Um, Matt's a good mate, but Matt does not like champagnes. Um, and... Uh, then he sent me a note saying, I finally found one I like. And it was this Ulysses Colin. I thought, I've never heard of this guy. He's a tiny little grower. And the same afternoon, I got an offer from one of the local importers who just imported a, uh, a small amount of it. So I've been buying his for ages and I visited him. He's the most fabulous guy. Um, what he does is brilliant. It's more sort of almost like Burgundy with bubbles. It's a different style, but I love what he does. Um, but look, yeah. Follin, Jacruz, Perrier Jouet, um, Paul certainly, um, Rotorer, uh, Philip and Ava is another one, that the Clos de Guas, um, there are just so many fantastic uh, houses out there. Luke? Um, Paul Roger would be the top. Um, apart from that, uh, Moe and Billy Cart something get consumed a lot in our household, but that's more special occasions. Uh, day to day, I'd probably be buying a ch- Good stuff. Carl? I'm actually a, a newbie in the French champagne. Um, I live in California wine country, and we have some really, really good local growers here uh, that I've drank a lot of. But uh, I'd say I'm drinking Paul Roger right now. I've had a few bottles, really like it. I uh, really like Bollinger. Um, had a 06 Dom Perignon Rosé on my honeymoon. So that was pretty, that was pretty freaking good. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, my interest is really high in it. And, you know, you know, look, looking to buy more and get, you know. Hey, okay, Carl, um, I, I got to say that champagne's great celebrating beginnings and endings, yeah? So once my, my divorce is finalised, it's finalised, the settlement's finalised, I'm opening that bottle of Dom Perignon. Um, absolutely. I'm looking forward to that one. So always keep a good a good bottle of champagne for the for the second step of marriages. Really? <laughs> uh, Brett, Brett. Thank you for all the help and well wishes. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 if I just had to pick my top three of the, uh, of the major houses, just leaving out kind of the, uh, uh, like, you know, the prestige cafes, some of the more regular stuff, uh, Bon Roger, uh, definitely, um, one that hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, is, uh, Renard, Ruinard, R-U-I-N-A-R-T, uh, they make a, a Blanc de Blanc, which is, uh, phenomenal. Um, although I'll, I also really like Pierre Peters Blanc de Blanc. Uh, and then I guess beyond that, oh, of course, Roterer. Uh, I think that the winemaker Roterer, Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon, is maybe may the, the most brilliant man making champagne right now. Uh, and uh, I, their vintages uh, represent, I think, uh, an excellent value uh, since they can all be had for under $100 and they're of a very, very high quality. Is Andre Jacquard sold in your guys' regions? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, not, we don't see it often. It, it, it pops up now and again, but we don't see it very often. That's really it's phenomenal nothing. stuff. Yeah, it, I think one of the, the small distributors has got hold of it. And so every now and again, you get a chance to try a bottle, but it's, you know. What about Pierre Peters? Do you get that? Yeah, Pierre, Pierre, Le Chatelons, I think, is one of the great wines. Yeah, yeah. That's that can be hard thing. to find, though. I mean, That's the production of the thing. growers is is much lower than the houses. I mean, an, an order of magnitude lower. The Terry Thies portfolio? Uh, we don't see, the, uh, I mean, we see some of the wines, but not through him. Not through him, but just through someone else. Yeah, yeah. But they all kind of fit into that niche, the farmer. Um, you might have seen a book on uh, bursting bubbles or something, which was a bit controversial a few years ago. Rob Walters wrote this book about uh, he was basically promoting all the growers ahead of the, the main houses and, and and he had his arguments why, but he's one of the main importers and he focuses on all these smaller houses 
Um, so his book was a bit self-serving, but uh, it got a lot of publicity. Uh, he brings a lot of those in. Yeah, in the Boston region, they have a very good stronghold on the market, the farmer fizz stuff. Yeah, we don't get a lot in Pennsylvania. I, I would I would argue though that uh, just because something uh, there's you know there's a, a movement towards uh, you know like a small small production is better and stuff like that in in, in a lot of different things that's not necessarily true in Champagne. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, you can get great uh, Champagne from growers, but you can get equally great uh, Champagne from the big houses. Bigger is not bad in Champagne. I don't think. Yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question yeah. in terms of pairing cigars and champagne, which I've always found to be a magnificent match? But does anyone else find find the same? Yeah, can I you think? Can you, do you believe? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I used to try and convince you of that ahead of because you always make us drink red wine, which I don't think works very well with cigars at all. You need um, the acidity. Okay. Okay. The, the champagne is just right. yeah, it doesn't have the tannins that destroys. Um, each other, you know, both of them. Uh, it works, yeah. I'm, I think it's a good match. The bubbles clear the palate. I mean, other yeah, than sweet wines, I think it's the best. Don't the come. bubbles clear the palate after each sip. Yeah, you know, makes it... yeah I think it's, it does. It works, it works well. I, I love it. Yeah. I think um, there's two cigars for some reason that work so well. I, I, I love D4s and Champagne. Uh, mm. Deep balls and champagne is just a, a classic match, and and San Cristobal, Forza, Forza, La Punta, any any San Cristobal for me just sings with champagne. Um, it just brings that Christmas cake aspect out beautifully. Um, but there are certain cigars. If I'm opening some champagne, I, I'll just go straight for those. I don't know. All of a sudden, with a D4 and champagne, the D4, the sourdough. It's like a sweet and sour dough. It's just beautiful the way it works together in, in the D4 and, and, and a glass of champagne. That's good. So <clears throat> FOH is watching this. Try it. Try matching champagne and cigars. It works exceptionally well. And sparkling whites too, yeah? I mean, it does have to be a champagne. I don't care. A good carver, a good Prosecco works exceptionally well with, with, uh, with cigars. Yeah, to be honest, uh, beginning of the year uh, uh, for the Sydney boys, I did a uh, champagne uh, tasting with a whole bunch of uh, non-vintage. I think we had about 10, um, actually it was eight champagnes and two Australian sparkling wines, uh, House of Arras and uh, Jans. And it, it paired fantastically, you know, to be honest with all the cigars. I mean, it was, it was absolutely fantastic. We loved it. John just wanted to add, there was, there was one bottle there, was the period Jew, Jew A that, um, yep. talking about nucleation and loss of gas, like you had it in the esky open for eight or ten hours and it like lost nothing. It was just, and we were saying, how could this honest, possibly be? To be honest, I actually left all those bottles in the esky, well, the ones that were left over, because I, I think you drank one entire bottle that night on your own. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ones that were left over. Oh, my bottle was good. <laughs> you know, you know, Cam Cam drank an entire bottle of stone on the House of Arras. But um, the, the, the bottles that were left over the next day, uh, sitting in the esky, they were actually still had a lot of you know, bubbles left over. They were, they were still perfectly fine. The they day. do make uh, 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 champagne corks, too. I mean, I can show you the one I have since yeah. I closed my bottle. But they're obviously you don't want to put a regular cork into a bottle of champagne and you can't fit the, the cork that you took out back in. Uh, but they tend to have clamps on the side. Um, and I use it. Uh, uh, what's that? They just use tea corks. You can use corks, but it, so it, tea corks, that, that style. Like on a, I'm not sure what a tea cork is. Oh, it has I, the plastic top on it. And it's like you would have on a tawny port or a sherry bottle or. I'm sure that works too. I, they, they, make, they, they make specialized champagne ones as well. Um, but you can stop a bottle of champagne. There are ways to do it. Yeah. It just the, needs a little the, bit of equipment. Sorry, Brett, I'll ask you. I didn't ask anyone. I'll ask Ken. But from a, from a punter perspective, my mom still believes in putting a teaspoon in champagne and that's enough. <laughs> I can never quite work out how the hell that is supposed to work. A teaspoon? 
Yes, of yeah, sugar? Yeah. No, you no, put it. Have you spoon. heard that, Ken? You've seen it, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah it's big, it's, a, lot of of people, a lot of people swear by it. Uh, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. I've, I've never heard that. Well, you just man up and drink the bottom. What the hell are you talking yeah, about? Drop a, drop a, a teaspoon that sits at the top of the bottle. You yeah, should just finish the bottle and be a man. It's, yeah. it's she's 84. I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not telling her much these days. Can I tell you? Um, she can do what she wants, but yeah, she still believes it. And you'll see in the fridge, there it is, teaspoon in there. She swears by it. Look, still that's, got bubbles. She's there. Hey, if that's the way she enjoys her champagne, then, yeah, you know, fine. that's the way she enjoys it. Yeah. I just, I'll just roll. I can't imagine a line through I've something else that. she told me yeah. that makes no sense. Okay. Perfect. Can I? Um, just add one more thing before we finish up the masterclass, and, and that is the topic of uh, rosé champagne. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because the American market is an anomaly in terms of rosé champagne worldwide. In Australia, it only accounts for 4% of sales. I'm, I'm drinking a rosé, and I, I love I love rosés. In fact, Tadejo rosé is probably one of my favourites of all champagnes. Um, but um, there's... there's the, the American market uh, accounts for uh, about 19% of all sales, uh, which is, stands out on its own, and um, uh, really, really interesting why that why that is. Um, but um, this, Ken, I just want to see what your thoughts are because there's two methods to making rosé champagne: the saunier, which where you leave the grapes a bit, a little bit longer. Um, but most of the houses go for the dessemblage, which means that they add a little bit of uh, red wine to it's the... It's the only place in France, Champagne's the only place in France where you can use two methods to make rosé. Um, yep. and, and there's no, it, it, the argument is neither is better, it's just whichever the house prefers. Um, the Saunier method you mentioned, which just basically you, you leave the... Uh, uh, juice on the skins for a tiny bit of time to they suck out a little bit of that cut because the juice the color in wine comes from the skins not the juice and so it sucks out a bit from the uh, uh the skins and then you take it off when you've got the color you want uh the easier way to do it um, and more reliable in terms of consistent color is adding uh, a small percentage of pinot noir which has got to be grown in the right areas in champagne um, and you can do either. There's no problem. Uh, there's not that many houses that do the Sonia method, but there's still a few. Uh, I think Rotor uh, has a proprietary method of doing it. That's kind of uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I know enough about it to describe it accurately. But they call it an infusion method. Yes, yeah, I know what you mean. And, and yes, I don't know enough about it to describe it either just basically seemed like a bit of a mix of the two. It might be proprietary. I don't know. Ken, do you do like Bollinger's any... still wine? Yeah, look, it's interesting. I've been actually trying to do an article on the still wines, but you can never get any samples of them because there's so few out here. Uh, Rotor have just brought out a couple that I haven't been able to see. In fact, the, the guy was going to bring a couple down the day they locked the borders. So he sort of said, no, unless you want me living with you for three months. The Bollinger is a red one, right? It's yeah, it's not, one. you can do red or white. Bollinger's red, uh, yeah. Enfance or whatever they call it. Uh, uh, and yeah, look, it's a it's a fine Pinot, sort of a bit like a light Burgundy. Um, it's pretty expensive. They're very expensive. Yeah, but well, they don't make very much. That is no, is, it's, is it's why. Uh, and, and they would be called that for those of you who aren't familiar would be called Coteau Champagnois, not Champagne. Yeah. Champagne would have bubbles. The, it's still from Champagne, it's the same grapes, it's just turned, they're grown differently and turned into still wines. But it's becoming, it, there are more and more people doing it because it's becoming more viable with, uh, you know, that double C word that, that Rob doesn't want us to mention. Climate well, change. Well, historically, though, <laughs> weren't, weren't the wines from that region still anyways, kind of like a pale red wine or between red and white? Yeah, they weren't very good, though. Yeah, nah. No, no, well, they, still, they were, they were like served still. for the kings and stuff. They were they were renowned at that time. I guess people didn't have a good palate in, in the 12th Yeah, the 12th I was joking. I was joking. You can still get Rosé de Rishi, which is a tiny little area within Champagne, uh, which I think is down near the Orb from memory. Um, and uh, they make, uh, there's only a few houses, but they make this rosé, 
which is different to the Cotto Champagne. Um, it's a special it's a special appellation on its own. And I remember um, the first time I went to Champagne, which was after I'd won a um, Champagne won the Champagne Award here, uh, and they send two people each. In those days, it was each year. You get two weeks in Champagne, which was pretty fantastic. And they were sending us down to this Rosé de Rishi place, and both we looked. We, we don't want to go and drink rosé. We want to go to. Don't waste our time. We'll go to a champagne house. No, no, no. We had to see everything. So down we went to this little place. This guy who hardly spoke English and showed us around, and we we're all, yeah, yeah, how long? You know, when are we out of here? Um, and then he sat us down for a tasting. And you know, this was '93 or something. I think I've still got a bottle of his '90 that I brought back. The wine, they were beautiful wines, but then he started going, this was in 93 that we were doing the tasting. Suddenly he's got 75s, 76s he's opening. Um, we're going, looking at the 60s. I don't think this is rosé. I've never seen old rosé that drinks like this. And then our, the bloke who was looking after us said, okay, it's now time to go. And we're going, no, no, we don't want to leave now. Now we like this place. We want to stay here. They had... Rosé is going back to the beginning of the century. They were going to show us if we'd been able to stay. That a drag is kicking and screaming it. How, how did it taste, Ken? What, what's age rosé taste like? Just, I've never had one. No, well, I mean, very few people have. It uh, gets incredibly complex, very, very sort of um, supple. Uh, the, the fruit tends to drop away a bit and you get other characters. Um, you think there was nothing left, you would think? It, we. You would think, but they were just beautiful wines. They were really beautiful wines. Um, Can I, because, go on, John. I, I've, I've just got a question because the UK and the US, when, when champagne, the champagne houses make champagne, they're, they're really focusing on the US, for exports to the UK and the US markets because they're like 21 and 20 million bottles last year. And then you got Japan third, which is about 10 million. Okay, and Australia's six and eight million, so it falls away a little bit. But I'm just I'm just trying to understand why is it in America that rosé is seen as a uh, a classier champagne that they, that counts for it one sells. in five bottles sold it is rosé. It, it's just all rosé is popular, and, and champagne is just kind of piggybacking off of a lot of marketing that goes into rosé wines, particularly during the summertime in America. Right. Um, all wine stores, especially during the summer, will have huge sections of just, you know, still rosés, Provence, domestic. Uh, it's just popular for some reason. What, Ken, was that rosé more like Tavelle rosé color or just or a white rosé? Sorry, Ken, was, that, was, that, was that more like a Tavelle kind of deep uh, rosé? No, the, the, the rosé de Rishis, it was actually... Yeah. The young ones were quite, uh, did have that much more of a cherry red. The older ones tended to f fade uh, quite pale, but surprisingly pale, really. Yeah. But that's the only time I've ever seen them. That's you know, once, whatever that was, nearly thirty we, years. We ago. might we might wrap it up there, Kenny, because I know you're you're struggling. You, you're not you're not well today, and I really thank you very much for for taking the time to to take us through this, and John as well for putting thank this you, together. Thank you, John. It's great. You've done a great job, and to me, I've I've learned a ton, and that's the whole idea. And enjoyed each other, everyone's company, at the same time. I think uh, instead of doing champagnes next time. I was, um, I was very much thinking about getting Yorgos and uh, Andy Ryan to host a whiskey, um, a, a whiskey session, whiskey and cigar session, because as you know, they run the, the largest, um, one of the largest uh, whiskey operations, whiskey retailers in Ireland. And it would be a fantastic session to do, but we'll do that one in Euro time. So it'd be a little bit more challenging for our US mates to, to join us for that. But it'll be evening for us, Ken and John, um, about eight, nine o'clock at night, and they can run through a whiskey and cigar session. And I'd like to run this through again with wines and different types of wines and different types of combinations. Um, I think we, we, we get a lot, a lot out of it. And it's a beautiful way of spending time is a cigar and, and a tipple. Yeah, it's just a fantastic way of spending time. So again, gentlemen, thank you so much for, for your input. John and Ken and everyone here who participated. Um, it is, it was fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Definitely. 
Thanks, Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone, yeah. very much. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.